Well, it's Monday, February 29th, 2016 at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Higher Ed Live Special Edition. Today, I am your host, Kent Casella, joining you from the lovely campus of Michigan State University. And on today's live broadcast, we're talking about a new roadmap for building and managing reputations in higher ed as colleges and universities navigate the unprecedented change in opinions, expectations, and dialogue with the public. So before we get started with today's broadcast, let's talk a little bit about Higher Ed Live and what the network offers. Higher Ed Live as a network offers viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in the industry. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. All episodes of Higher Ed Live are free, and they're accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast form, if you want, from iTunes. Today is a special edition of Higher Ed Live, and this episode is made possible by Public Relations Society of America's Counselors to Higher Education Professional Interest Section, also known as the CHE. The CHE section provides higher education public relations professionals high-quality in-person programs, publications, and virtual networks to help promote the value, power, and the appropriate role of public relations to their institutions. Members of CHE have exclusive access to analysis, trends, and tools to provide strategic leadership in public relations at colleges and universities all across the country. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communication firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and much more. So, let's get to the program today. Joining me for the program today is Julia Weed, the Executive Vice President and Leader of Edelman's Education Sector, providing strategic counsel and support to educators, schools, and organizations. With more than 20 years experience in education and nonprofit communication strategy, Julia helps education clients communicate their mission, initiatives, and campaigns to the stakeholders. She's an expert in national media relations, platform development, and thought leadership. At Edelman, she's worked with Tier 1 universities, Ivy League universities, research institutes, regional colleges, K-12 schools, nonprofit policy organizations, and corporations, and that's a very long list, uh, <laughs> assisting them to find their voice and participate in the national dialogue all about education. So a little bit more about Julia. She began her career in the enrollment side of the house, first for St. Olaf College, Go Lions, and uh, Wisconsin Lutheran College. She later worked in marketing for Concordia, New York, the New York Trust for Historic Preservation, New York Botanical Gardens, and the gorgeous, gorgeous Biltmore Estates in New York. She's a member of PRSA, PRSA's Council on Higher Education, and the Council for Advancement of Support of Education. She holds a BA degree in English from St. Olaf College. Welcome to the show, Julia. Thanks, Ken. It's good to have you here. So, little housekeeping for all of you that are watching along today. Please don't hesitate to ask your questions uh, using the hashtag. So, today's hashtag is hashtag higher ed live. Hashtag higher ed live. I will sort through your questions and I'll do my best to ask as many of them as I can in the time we have uh, as we go through our presentation today. So hashtag higher ed live if you have questions. So Julia, as, uh, as I thought about our session here today, um, I just thought about life at the university and universities in our, our, our country and how it seems like, to me at least, I think for many years, perhaps too many years, universities may have rested on their past successes and didn't feel the real need to work to maintain their reputation with key audiences or publics. And when I said about when I said when I was thinking about that uh, before we got into this, I thought, why would anyone? Who would question the performance or relevance of these great institutions we have? 
I mean, the American-style education system is the envy of the world. Our research is top-notch. Our institutions have been trusted, solid, and steady performers for centuries. But as I thought about the work you were doing there, my fear is that level of comfort may have led to a drift and a disconnect. And I think that's what you were seeing and investigating here. So as we delve into that, tell us a little bit about what problem you saw that caused you to want to do this research. Yeah, thanks, Ken, very much. And first of all, thank you so much to you and the Higher Ed Live folks and the folks at PRSA Counselors to Higher Education. It's a great, um, great format and a great platform for us to have these kinds of conversations. So <clears throat> to answer your question, really over the last few years, we've been doing quite a bit of research on brand and brand awareness and universities would come to us and ask us to take a look at you know what is what about our reputation how do people know us and as we were doing this research over several universities we started to see underneath it an underlying um, trend of, of data and more importantly also a trend in terms of the way the conversations were going but while we spent many hours researching into the faculty staff students alumni friends and donors of universities there was much conversation that was going on in higher ed about higher ed, but at the same time, as folks that work with media and public relations, we were seeing an entirely different conversation taking place in the media. As we all know, the, the pressures for the headlines, the constant pressures on, on issues such as um, the value of a degree, the worth of a degree, the ROI of a degree, um, you know, graduate employment, and then issues like um, Title IX and assault, sexual assault issues, and um, and other you know great pressures that we were starting to see that the public and those in academia tended to talk about very different things when they talked about higher education. It was getting to the point, to your point, Kent, that it was almost two different conversations, and so. We found uh, an opportunity to, to, to tap some of our folks that we have at Edelman in research and, um, and, and said what would it be like if we could actually test this, test this on a national level. And that's the result of this research. So tell us a little bit about uh, specifically what did you set out to investigate in, in your research? Yeah, so what we set out to look at is, um, is, is to a certain extent a little bit about um, the, get this gap that we're seeing, um, the gap that we saw between kind of the, the point of view of those in higher education and those actually in the public. Um, and what I'd be happy to do is share some of these slides with you guys as we go through it so you can see some of the, some of the actual research. But what we did is we, we set about, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up so you can take a look real quickly here. Um, I'm, hang on, I'm going to pull up this, the research. Here we go. Um, and talk you through it. So since we're talking to academics, what we'll do is we'll show you a little bit about the methodology. So the objective of the study was to take a look at how the United States, those in the public, evaluate the reputations of higher ed and how those drivers kind of vary across economic and generational groups. So this dual conversation that was going on, we were taking a look and trying to come to a point of understanding a little bit about what was driving this gap and more importantly therefore what this downward pressure that we were seeing on institutional reputations was like. So to do it we did a quick survey of about 2,000 public um, that is across also socioeconomic groups. As part of a subset of that we took a look at what we call the informed publics which are uh, generally what universities would call their influencers or policy makers. These tend to be the folks who are higher degree educated, the upper quart quartile income, they kind of engage frequently with top tier media. And then we also did a, a secondary sample of, of those in higher education from four year higher education institutions, both professional and faculty. So it was a survey that was fielded online last year in October. So let's keep going through that then. Um, this is a little bit about what we were looking at. Is, as I said, we saw the public and academics were kind of pretty disconnected on the role of universities and therefore what drives reputation. Overlooking the public's point of view is, is we believe, really starting to put institutions at risk. If we're not listening um, as well as we could to, especially for state institutions, if we're not listening as well as we could to the public, this was driving some, some serious concerns. The good news here is that we're seeing, and the research shows that it's a little bit less about what universities offer 
and, and it's actually maybe a little bit more about how universities communicate about what they're offering and what they're doing. And so I'm going to hop in here, Kent, and if you have any questions, just kind of let's, let's just go along the way here. Sure. The one part that I might have missed, uh, your mix of your universities and colleges you looked at, a uh, mix of yep. public and private? Yeah, we did. Um, we actually took a look, and you'll see in the back of the research that um, there's a front court part where we just asked you know, the public about their actual opinions on different topics. And then the back, we actually asked specifically for them to talk about what they believed was driving reputations in the university, in the public. And particularly, then we asked them and tested their, their thoughts against actual university reputations. It was a very interesting, very interesting uh, effort. So you've boiled this down. Uh, what we're going to show people is your five major takeaways or insights that the research showed. Exactly. So Great. let's go to it. Here we go. So the key insights are this. And what we'll do is I'll take you through those five insights. And what we'll do is we will, um, I'll talk through those five insights. I'll show you the data. And the end of each one will give some kind of takeaways for the communicators that might be looking and, and joining us here, things that will kind of pretty much hopefully bring some higher insights into how we can start thinking about reputations um, in higher education. So if you start thinking about all of the headlines that you've been seeing across um, across especially higher education news for the last couple of years, you'll see that there's been an awful lot of downward pressure on the kinds of uh, things that are driving the public conversation in education. We found as a result that there's a fraying belief in the state of higher education in the United States. Um, and we'll go into that just a little bit. That the second point is that there is this disconnect. We found it. We were able to quantify it a little bit between those in um, higher education and the public when it comes to actually the, what the public believes is the role of a university, what universities are for. Um, in diving deeper, we found that academic excellence when it comes to universities' reputations is not enough, which is really interesting, and we'll talk about that. The public expects something quite different when it comes to um, what universities and their roles they should be filling in society. We really said that you must, we found that you must demonstrate real world impact, both personal and societal, to change reputations. And, and the data shows that it's, it's, just, it's kind of not just about being academically excellent. And as a, as a gift to those um, public um, relations and communications folks at colleges and universities across the country, we have data that shows now that academics' media preferences diverge greatly from the public's and shouldn't be the sole driver of external PR strategy. Many in higher education communications know this, but sometimes it's hard to have the data that will help to shape strategy in ways that make sense to higher education leaders. So we have some of that insight on that as well. So let's just dive right in. I'll take you through some of this. And again, I would much rather this be a dialogue than a, than a presentation. But uh, And I think, again, I'll just remind the audience that the hashtag is hashtag higher ed live. Um, if you want to um, ask questions as we go, Kent um, will be able to field those and, and get those to us. So what about this fraying belief in the state of higher education? It's a pretty big statement, but this is how we tested it out. Um, Given what we were hearing across public conversations, we asked the question, it's kind of the classic communicator's question, do you approve or disapprove? You know, thumbs up, thumbs down, or in this particular case, for education. The, the question was, um, do you believe that the U.S. higher education system is headed in the right direction or is off on the wrong track? Um, we found some very interesting feedback that 60%, almost 60% of the general population um, really did not believe higher education was on the right track. We were really actually surprised by the fact that 51% of those in higher education agreed. Um, we have a little bit of data later on. Uh, those that are good data wonks usually raise their hands at this point and say, well, do you think it's for the same reasons? No, actually, we think they're for very different reasons. But it points to a higher sense of unease right now about the role of the university and, and how what it, is, what it is in American higher education. So the next question always is, well, what do you mean by wrong track? So we dove into that a little bit. So we asked one of those great kind of dual questions where both of the statements are true, but in, tr in order to get to kind of the best idea of sentiment, we asked them to tell us which they felt was most, what they agreed with most, that either the traditional role of the university is critical to society or society demands that the traditional role of the university needs to evolve. Um, so you could probably guess um, that maybe where this would fall, but even we were surprised at the consistency of the results here. 
that um, when you take a look at the public on the left hand side of that dividing line you'll see that it is broken out by, ge by general population and that subset of informed public as well and on the right hand side we took that same data and broke it out by age group um, and you know those of us that work in data will see that you know that level of response the consistency response is, is pretty strong and that 20 point disconnect really was showing that you know the majority of those in higher education not, not surprisingly, all, all of us that have worked in, in the academy for years know that a great um, education, you know, that, that that's what drives, it's critical to society. But here's the inverse of that question. 60% um, of those in the public absolutely believe that the role of the university must evolve. And, uh, and we found that to be interesting. So the next question comes, you know, evolve to what? Um, so, but let's quick talk about, about a takeaway here. The first takeaway is that really, again, you know, going to your earlier question, Kent, much of higher education's focus is, is has always been in higher education, about higher education, in peers and among peers within the academy. Um, and that is changing, I think. Um, and overlooking that public's point of view can put institutions at risk, all kinds of institutions, public and private. Um, I think it is a particular challenge for public institutions, but you know the private folks would raise their hand and say, not quite so sure about that. But issues like enrollment, tuition, taxpayer funding are all at stake. Um, so you know, so so that's a good quick takeaway. Insight number two is there's a significant disconnect between academics and the public in the actual role of universities. So all right, if if we now have seen this disconnect and the public really believes that the university needs to evolve, what does that mean? So we asked again one of those dual statements um, about what do you think, which do you agree with most here? Is it more important that universities focus on providing a well-rounded education and student experience, who explained what that was kind of traditional academic thought, um, or is it more important that universities focus on providing students with tools and resources they need to succeed in a specific career? So uh, you can probably guess where this is going to go, and indeed it did. Um, even a greater greater disconnect between those in higher ed and and those you know in the general public. So 71% of those in higher ed felt that a well-rounded education is the most important thing that universities and, and colleges and universities can offer. Um, and again, the level, the consistent level of um, of feedback from the public in terms of um, the inverse of that question, which is the public at between 53 and nearly 60 percent believe that um, the tools and resources for a successful career are perhaps the most important thing that universities can focus on right now. Um, and so diving a little bit deeper into that, we asked a set of about 11, we, we gave uh, about 11 different um, challenges that based on research that we had done at several other colleges and universities and by the way this whole this whole um, study is based on research that we've done previously for other schools many of the questions and the 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 attributes and things that we tested are, are tests that we've done pretty much across higher ed so when we take it into the public this is a very interesting um, very interesting finding so we asked them what are the critical challenges that you believe are facing higher education um, besides cost. And we took a look here and we saw that, again, the answers that those in higher ed answered um, were very different from those in the public. And we start, this is a gap that I think we will consistently see um, across all kinds of, um, all kinds of data. That those in, in the academy, um, not surprisingly, are very focused on scholarship and the quality of teaching, quality of experience, um, and, and prep for a broad understanding of the world. And the public, if you take a look on the right-hand side and in the informed public, it's, it's all about employment and graduation um, jobs, career services, um, and, and concerns about being able to find a job after graduation. It couldn't be more consistent. So, so diving, go ahead, Ken. Let me ask you, so I think that's a, that's a common tension there. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little more, or do you have additional data that talks about the things that they see are being the the major reasons why academics think one way and the general population thinks the other way. Yeah, I think what we can do, I mean, so it's, it's very interesting because I think, again, going back to that premise that we've had, that I think 
if you step back and look at those things that have been driving the thinking about higher education marketing for the last maybe two decades, arguably since the 80s when rankings kind of, you know, saw the increased prevalence. Right. So it was those, right? So, so it drove so much of the conversation on reputation towards issues of selectivity and the amount of research and um, the, the type of, of um, the, the type of um, prestige that you have, all of those great prestige, and even some of those arcane metrics like, you know, number of, of faculty with terminal degrees. So those metrics that drive rankings have become, I think, a, for all obvious reasons, a very much a driver of the, you know, of, of the thinking within higher education. And, and for good or for bad, rankings have driven so much of it. And again, I say this with you know, real respect for those folks who are who are looking to run universities. It is an all-encompassing, all um, all completely obsessive thing to to do what it takes to drive a great university is all of these internal metrics. Yeah. And I think to your earlier point, the way you kicked it off, I think part of the conversation that has not been heard quite as much has to do with therefore you know where the public sits. So I do have more data. Should we keep going? Sure. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's pull it up. So. Um, so I think what you have here is that we took these 11, we asked again, these are the critical challenges facing higher education. What's interesting is we kind of loosely group them. There's one that has to do about access, which is, um, you know, too competitive. Then there's these, these issues that we find very important to those um, in higher ed, those issues that we roughly are calling teaching or scholarship. Um, score very high in, in terms of the things that they're concerned about. And then there's this other side, which are the things that the public tends to be focused about, which falls loosely under training or opportunity. What we found really interesting is that if you look at the right-hand side of this data, those things that I guess we would describe as programmatic offerings, and those things that the university is offering or doing, fell much lower in those concerns. So STEM programs, which you hear a lot about, you know, fewer people worried about that. Even the number of degrees that you often or eat offer, or even for that matter, you know, the the lack of, uh, you know, the, the low graduation rates in higher education. So the actual programmatic offerings are maybe not quite so much a driver. So what we this led us to to kind of speculate on this, and we think that this is a really interesting point that it may have actually less to do about what you offer, what your programs are. But it may be more about how you're communicating what you're doing. And by this we mean that those of us that are part of and have always been part of higher education and the academy tend to know that an excellent education does lead to great opportunities in the job market. It's not monolithic. We know that there are lots of challenges across that. But the fact of the matter is, is that those that do this for a living have always known that the right kind of preparation and a good education is going to drive, and all the statistics show it, right, um, in terms of, of job driving in higher education. But what's interesting is that if you take a look at the public's concerns, even though those that are traditionally part of the higher education world know this, um, it's, it's not self-evident to the public. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think it's even safer to say just because it's, we say it's true, the public is not necessarily likely to believe us. So I think that perhaps one of the smartest things, to hear, one of the biggest um, points here is that we need to find new language to explain the value of what a good, strong degree will offer. Um, and that does not necessarily mean that that is, an, is a path for every student. And we get that and we understand it. And certainly it has to be balanced programmatically with training and um, you know, career prep, but if we can't connect the importance of a full rounded education as a value, then how, with all of the new populations that are entering the college market um, and, and first time generation kids, uh, you know, besides the families that are trying to figure out whether it's worth it, if we can't find that language, then, um, you know, then how, how can we expect them to understand it? So our takeaway on this particular data point is connect the career dots particularly you know, the public doesn't necessarily believe the connection between a degree and job preparation is real. Um, and I think that that is on us um, to do a better job explaining. Um, because as we all know, kind of the data that shows the, the earning potential for those <clears throat> post, you know, graduation with a college degree is so much greater than those that don't go through higher ed. But I think they're, they're not necessarily test, they're not necessarily believing that. Um, so, I think that that's an interesting finding there. 
I think we've well, those of us in higher ed have heard that disconnect for a while. I like the data and the way you've presented it there. Those insights are good. I think it would be interesting to overlay that as we get into the creative problem solving issue. Yeah. Is what's the balance between, um, and maybe this would be an area for further study where you bring in those Fortune 500 companies and those CEOs that keep saying, I need someone who can think creatively and solve creative problems and how that kind of data might help connect the dots, like you said, between these two, uh, these two audiences and the disconnect between academics and uh, what the general public wants yeah. in the university. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I've, I've heard, I think we've all heard this observation also that many families, when they're looking at the investment of higher education, are almost treating it as a small, you know, small business loan. Right. You know, that I'm going to invest in this and what do I get out of it? And I think that, you know, those of us that, you know, and, and you're talking to an English liberal arts major, all right? So I remember, you know, English major at a liberal arts college. So I know this. I understand it. And I know that um, sometimes, the, you know, the foundation of a good, solid education is, 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 the, is the most important thing. Right. But the language, right, learning the language, I think part of it, you know, if people have asked me and I've said, well, if I could, you know, wave my wand of, you know, what I would wish, it would be that we would start as institutions recognizing um, and being able to do a better job commuting, communicating even what individual classes or individual discipline, what value they have outside of the walls of just learning the discipline. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, complete, it's a complete conversation. Yeah. So. yeah, and I think therein lies the challenge there is what's, what do we say and what do they expect? That's right. So let's keep rolling because I think that some of that kind of um, that kind of moves forward. So so therefore, to your point, what does the public expect? So what we did is we actually asked them then, what are your opinions about um, uh, what drives the reputation of, of top universities? Right. So when you think about the best university, you know, just generally, what does it take to be a top university? What we did is we took, based again on our previous research with several other universities. About 24 attributes that um, that we've been asked to always kind of look at and assess when it comes to reputational strength. We group them loosely into six different um, categories to analyze, and this here it's truncated quite a bit um, for for brevity. But you'll see that we took kind of those things that generally are understood from teaching, you know, scholarship, training, which has to do with opportunities, impact, which has to do with kind of what the university, the impact the university has um, outside of its walls, really. Um, offering, which is kind of the non-academic offerings, um, alumni network, cultural activities, athletics. Um, those traditional things of prestige, high quality students, diversity, where they where universities land on rankings. And then um, access is financial support for any student that, um, you know, those who particularly have um, um, financial challenges for attending school. How do we make sure that they have access? So those are some of the traditional measures. So what's interesting is we asked them then, both in academia and in general population, what are the three most important attributes if you think of top universities in America? What are those things? We found it fascinating that two of the three things actually tracked the same across 24, which is really interesting. But we also found it even more interesting that, of course, number one, again, speaks to that gap. Um, and, you know, both are true, but boy, when you look at the priorities, it's, it couldn't be more different. So those in academia are looking, again, for scholarship, deep exploration of a field of study that develops theorists and practitioners. Couldn't have a more academic phrase, right? Um, and with the public, it's jobs and opportunity. They want to know um, that, that there's going to be an outcome here. Um, just very briefly, I'm going to give a shout out um, on a couple of things. So these num number two and number three. Um, we're really delighted to see that they were consistent, um, you know, providing sufficient financial support for students. Again, the access question um, is very high in the public's mind when it comes to the reputation of top schools. And then the second, this other point is this, uh, this point that faculty who provide personalized attention invest in the success of their students. Um, this, this is kind of in, incredibly important. I think this concept of mentorship, I'm going to also point folks to, go ahead and Google it, it is the um, Purdue the, the Gallup Purdue Index, which launched in 2014, it, look at, it looked at 20-year markers um, as to what provided the most satisfaction for um, graduates when they did a survey. And um, the three, there were several things that showed up. One, of course, was a kind of well-balanced, diverse, experiential, 
higher education experience, right, so academic degree. Second would be uh, student experience that is diverse and active, that students that were, are most happy now 20 years later had a great experience while they were there, that they were engaged across, you know, the university in a lot of different ways. But perhaps the most interesting thing to me, which also proves on this slide as well, is that one of the top drivers 20 years out for success in graduation in this Gallup study is a mentor who cared. Uh, and you'll see that across a bunch of the data that they present. So I think mentoring is a very, very important thing. And, and again, uh, you know, I would, I would just point to that as, as a very powerful, um, very powerful agreed upon priority for students and for, for faculty. So let's just dive in a little bit farther. Um, so we took those six, you know, all of those categories and grouped them. Again, access, impact, training, teaching. But what we found that was these are ranked in order of um, general population um, preference and what is most important to the general population. And so what we found very interestingly, we're glad to see, again, access important to everybody. This question of impact, both for the general population and informed population, very important, kind of this impact outside of the walls. What is the university doing to impact or improve society? Training, extremely important in terms of, again, jobs and opportunity. And so teaching, or the, the whole aspect of scholarship, you know, falls forth on this chart, which we find interesting. I guess what I would say is that I don't, in my personal opinion here, we don't have the, the data to exactly prove it, but I think, again, if you remember, the question is, what does it take to be considered a top university? I think this is true for many of the public, um, that they trust or they believe, they already assume that higher quality education or academics is going to be there. Um, I think that, you know, to your early point, Kent, the public kind of trusts that universities have had this license to lead. The public has trusted for a long time that universities are getting this right. Um, and so now I think there's an assumption, just a little bit, that that quality of academia, uh, academic excellence is still there. Prestige and kind of outside offerings follow um, on the least most important. So this is one of my favorite takeaways, um, just in a basic, I, I guess if I were to put something on a plaque on the wall, it would be this. As a general summary about a lot of these findings, it, when you're talking to those inside, the leaders inside at higher ed, about reputation. The biggest takeaway is that basically it's not just about you. It's not just about the excellence that you have. It's important to have that. It's not just about all of the great programs that you're driving. It's also very much about them. It's very much about the public. They expect universities, universities to be excellent at what you do. And they're really looking um, to you to use that excellence to provide opportunity beyond the academic walls. So, you know, I think that's kind of an interesting, kind of an interesting point that if, you know, I, I would just say it's not those of us that only talk about what a great and strong school we have or we are may not be seeing the whole picture. We're talking to Julia Weed, the Executive Vice President from Edelman's Education Sector. And Julia, this, I, I really like the insights we've got on these slides here. Um, We've got, uh, got some question or a little bit of commentary here from, uh, from some of our viewers. They said, it seems like academics are trying to preserve what institutions have been, but the public is pushing for what they should be. So does it seem like, and I think by this takeaway, it, it starts to sound that way, is um, universities may be behind on uh, what, what the public thinks they should be in the direction they should be going in or maybe just not articulating well uh, the things that the universities are doing well and the impact those can have outside the walls. Yeah, I think I think you know, like we said in some of, in some of the data, it may it, yes, I think partly it's programmatic, um, and I think partly that universities or that the public really is, you know, we have to be able to prove programmatically that what we're doing is leading to opportunity outside of the walls, but. I think that it's a pretty good insight, um, and Derek, I think, has kind of, you know, put his finger on part of, you know, you always want to be careful what you're interpreting from data, but to me, it feels like that's pretty accurate. And, but, but I think also, like I said, it almost has as much to do with what we have been focusing on as communicators, um, and that really, once you start pivoting to the public's point of view and what they're looking for, it's not that they don't think that universities aren't doing important things. I think it's that right now, like we said, there's, we're, we're talking past each other in some pretty significant ways. Well, if it's what the public is looking for, can the top universities, and maybe if you look at uh, big or research universities, public and private, can they deliver on what the public wants? Or yeah. 
are other institutions better at that? Yeah. So let's take a look, actually, specifically. Funny you should ask that. What a great uh, segue. <laughs> exactly. I so let's do that on purpose. Yep. So let's take a look. So when we started, we we now shifted the conversation a little bit in our research, and we said, you know, beyond asking folks what do you think drives the best university reputations, now what we did is we asked them about real universities that they knew about. So what we did, basically comparing what they say versus what they think, is we took a look at a randomized list of 100 top universities. Um, and just for sakes that you guys know, the, the, the universities were comprised of the 60 AAU universities and 10 um, of, the, of the top regional, four regional universities, so 40 total um, from each of the four regions of the United States of, uh, as selected by U.S. News and World Report. So we did is we randomized that list based on where the, the respondent was located and, and kind of gave them a list of, um, a list of, of basically uh, what attributes they would use to describe those universities. So pick these universities you know well that you believe are top universities. What do you think um, you would use to describe those universities? So what this does is it kind of gives us an analysis, and there's researchers way smarter than me uh, that can talk all about, you know, derived analysis. But what this does is it gives us an insight into what they say versus what they think. I'm not going to give you guys this whole massive scatter chart. What we've tried to do is we've tried to pull out some of the top some of the top questions. Um, and I think, you know, I see we also got a, a question from Bob Finnerty from IRT. RIT, sorry, Bob. So you said boiling it down, is this about ROI for the public? And I think the answer is, you know, partly, definitely yes. And let's let's take a look at a little bit at um, what this research shows us. So if you take it, let me just quick describe the chart. So this chart, we took those same attributes and, and asked these questions. And when those attributes landed in the top upper left hand corner, this kind of in this category that we call expected. These are those attributes that are really kind of required for universities to be considered leaders. But if you only talk about those things, you're not going to change anybody's mind. They're kind of the must-haves. They're but you know, like if you're a poker player, they're kind of the table stakes, right? You need to have them to be considered a top university. But if you only focus on those things, you won't change minds. For the purpose of this conversation and the, the little bit of time we have left, we're going to focus on this top upper right hand corner, which is not just those things that they say are, are you know, important, but those things that really should be headlines from a communication standpoint. I'm going to back up and give you one more bit of observation. The left hand column from bottom to top is for you know, the purposes of an English major, those things that um, people say are important. The bottom row from left to right are those things that people really believe or, or think when it comes to um, those that are most important. The bottom right hand corner is those opportunities that really kind of are not the things you necessarily can talk about but still drive reputation. Um, they're kind of hidden gems. Um, things like great diversity fall down here um, and, and some other attributes as well. But for the little bit of time we have left, let's take a look at this and, um, and if you look at the upper right hand corner of this screen you'll see that in, this is now the focus of, of this slide. These are the eight attributes that fell into the top right hand quadrant of those attributes that the US public believes are the drivers of the universities that they believe are the best universities. So, you know, of these eight drivers, you look at the top three, prestige, you know, high cal caliber class of students, and then those things about scholarship and teaching, high quality faculty, and faculty that is doing breakthrough in the research and areas of study. So those three traditional things very much still a part of the public's point of view. But what's interesting to us is that there are five of the eight that don't have to do with the quality of the school itself and or the, those traditional measures that we would normally look at. They have again to do with this sense of opportunity um, post-graduation or outside the walls of campus. So, so those things that prepare students to be leaders, provide top job opportunities, and three of the eight are actually about real world impact, which we thought was really interesting. So those things that are future focused, they solve long term challenges facing the world. 
Um, we focus research on innovation, on creating things that are actually introduced into the market. Again, real world. We keep on seeing these real world words pop up in this category, promoting this solving ability to solve problems that are relevant to how things are solved in the real world. So um, I think it's a very significant and interesting finding that in that top quadrant, five of the eight, don't have to do with the actual um, uh, measurable uh, prestige or quality of, of a school that have to do with the impact of it. So just to give you a few more insights quickly on this part, um, if you again look in the top right hand corner on the scatter graph that we got, those things that fell underneath that teaching category, which is so important to those um, in academia particularly, um, kind of fell across the midline of that chart. These are those attributes. So um, you know, it, again, showing that the things that we usually focus on, you know, um, when we're talking about higher education are good, they're, they're important, but they're not necessarily the most important drivers of public attitude. Um, and again, then if you look at those things that really have been scoring in all of our other research as high, high, of high importance to the public, all of the attributes that have to do with training or impact on the real world, those things actually fell across the top of the graph. Um, so again, it kind of has to do with um, has to do with you know being um, externally focused and understanding for the public these things are important. Um, and here's very quickly one of our favorite um, favorite graphs. And this this is a kind of a dive, a subset of a subset of the data. And when we actually saw this, because we were looking for good insights, we actually did a little research jig. So um, so. In this sense of, again, this, this um, 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 topic of impact and, and the, the attributes that, that describe impact, as you look at where those fall across this chart, you'll see that those things that have more to do with personal impact um, for you know individuals, faculty providing you know personalized attention and the success of students and instilling students with the courage and confidence to achieve personal goals, those tended to fall a little bit more in the expected category. And interestingly, on the right hand side you'll see that societal impact, those real world world drivers that we were talking about before, really fell more into the driver category. So I think that that's a really interesting takeaway, um, that it is, I think society, I think the public expects great universities to not just do a good job pro providing opportunity, but I think that they're looking to good colleges and universities to also kind of change or impact the world around them in important ways. Uh, I think that that's a key part of drivers. So I think that that, you know, in this particular part of the data is perhaps um, you know, one of the most important that it's really critical to connect this excellence that you have to real world impact. You know, when we talk about this at Edelman, um, kind of outside of academia, outside of higher ed, for consumer clients and for corporate clients, we call it living your brand. You know, how do you live your brand in authentic, incredible ways with external audiences? And I get a lot of questions about this and people say okay well this is all well and good but how 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 on earth can you do this and I think we're seeing some universities do it it begin to, to pivot and do this and it has to do with this sense of understanding that some of the great things that universities are currently doing are kind of being done inside the academy inside the walls and they're interesting things and I know a lot of you know education communicators are out there saying well we tell these great stories about research but maybe there is a better way to find what's happening to pull together some great initiatives to to create and develop them in in a way that is designed to communicate externally a little bit more intentionally um, and and put in place you know campaigns or programs that really connect in a very different strategic way than, um, than the ways that we've been doing that in the past. Well, Tammy asked, Tammy from Kennesaw State asked a very interesting question about how do we as communicators, how do we balance the messaging to the public and the messaging to our peers, and I'll add one more group, to our yeah. internal audiences to help them connect all of those to increase yeah. their reputation. It is a challenge, right? It is very much a challenge. And I think um, that that does not mean, and none of this data is, is in any way meant to say, that we should therefore stop communicating in and among peers. Um, and as we head into some of the final parts of data here, we took a look at what are some of the channels, the, the places where 
um, where um, both those in academia and those in the public talk, um, I think you'll find they're very different places. So I don't think this is an either or. I also don't think it has to even be an exclusively different conversation. If, if I were if, if I could have a wish for American higher education, it would be that we would find faculty and peers who are able to, and we do have, you know, not that we can't find them, it's that, that more and more we would have peers within our own institutions um, be able to talk about this in ways that mean new, you know, fresh new language, it mean things differently to the public. And I think, I believe that in doing so, you also will raise your reputation among your peers as well. It is, it is not to say that it's an either or. Uh, you can't stop talking uh, among peers. Um, but I think it's a great question. And, you know, yeah, so the question is how, you know, how, how does this happen? I think that it can happen over time with very intentional programs. One of the ways that can maybe help guide is in this last bit of the data. Um, and so what we did, you know, being communicators um, ourselves, we kind of dove deeply into um, media preferences. And I think this might be part of the answer to the question, Tammy, and that is that um, understanding where they are and understanding the power of content um, I think is going to be a significant part of the answer. Before I dive into the data, I'm going to also share with you an interesting data point um, that, that um, some other Edelman research we came across. Um, Edelman does kind of these yearly conversations and yearly surveys on things like what media do you trust most, what voices you know, in and among the public conversations do you trust most. It's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And, um, and actually now this data is already last year's data. So if you felt the earth move last year, we're going to kind of give you one of the possible reasons that might have happened. Um, and that is that last year was the first year that search, literally search, became the first um, most trusted vehicle for news and information among the American public. So now when people are looking for news or information, they go to search first. They don't go to the front page of a news site. Um, they usually don't go to the front page of anywhere anymore. So that is a sea change when it comes to content. And I think understanding that and starting to think differently about content is really important. And I'll show you where that comes in. But therefore, it means that universities and colleges that are creating their own content if managed well and correctly, have the ability to be standing alongside um, other great sources of information when it comes to search. And so let's dive into this a little bit. So first of all, let's, let's, the, the first question we asked was, um, what sources do you use when researching or reading about higher education? Uh, again, these are ranked in order of importance for the general population. Um, and on the left-hand side, and I'll probably do this ne differently next year when we do this, but those things that have to do with the direct engagement with the university, visiting the campus, brochures, I think you could arguably say, websites, the things the university says about itself um, tend to be pretty highly trusted. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And we see this across other parts of our research as well, that the public trusts the voice of higher education. They trust academic experts. They trust academic institutions when it comes to what they have to say. Um, then if you look at the external engagement things, again, kind of what you see here is interesting, that online search, again, is king, absolutely king. So creating content and, and, and indexing it well is important. But as you start looking now at, at kind of stepping back and, and looking at the academics versus general population versus inform, informed population, you start to see some interesting trends. And, and I, I think, again, back to Tammy's question, those in higher education speak to each other. They go to each other for their own information, and, and that is a very powerful channel that will never, I won't say will never change, but is not changing right now. And I think so, therefore, the conversation in and amongst peers stays in and among peers. But what's so interesting is where the public goes as opposed to with those in higher ed. And this, again, kind of to me also shows the gap in the conversation. Um, when we look at that same data across generations, so now we split it um, um, in age groups, um, same rough trending, you start to see this social media trend emerge. Um, again, this is looking for you know, who uses a different sources of information researching or reading about higher education. Um, for the purposes of higher education, also I'll just remind everybody that Gen Z tends to be your current students or very prospective current students or recent alumni. Gen Y, definitely your alumni. So um, interesting to note in there. 
um, that social media networks and those of us that do communications, this isn't necessarily a, a, a major, a big surprise when it comes to the population. But I think it's very interesting to watch the age groups and how that enrolls. Um, so this is kind of interesting. It's a different question. It is, what sources do you use for general news and information? Um, and again, you know, online news is, is pretty huge. Um, you know, TV is interesting. Newspapers drop away. But where it gets very interesting, again, is this large gap in social networks. Um, you know, the public is basically more likely to be found there. Um, content sharing sites and blogs. It's where they go. And so understanding that and remembering that when you're looking to communicate with them as opposed to peers is, I think, very, very interesting. So you tie this data with that point that I made about search being a number one source that's trusted, um, and you start kind of maybe understanding the power of your own content and the potential for universities to create content that start is starting to message in a different way and not just only have to rely on traditional media to do it. So, um, you know, somebody asked me once about the different models of higher education communications, and and I said, you know, we've kind of been been traditionally um, entrenched some universities entrenched into this long form, you know, long form storytelling that we've done for decades. And the interesting thing is that many of the national media trends have completely come full circle to 360, where long, where good storytelling uh, and long, potentially even long form storytelling, is an asset um, in in communications telling. So I want to dive a little bit um, farther, and then hopefully leave a few more minutes for questions, but. People ask, well, what, you know, they, they've been asking a little bit about social media. So this is a subset of a subset that we find, I think this is one of the most interesting slides. Maybe not surprising, except in the gap. So we took a look at, you know, use of social networks and saw that, and I suspect this is actually low in reporting, 62% of current students and recent alumni, 60% use social media for general news and information. And you look at those um, inside higher education, and only 22% do. And that's a 40% gap. So I think this is most interesting, and I think those of you that are working in social media for higher education, usually these are the ones that are vehemently nodding their heads in the room when we talk about this, um, that there's this 40% gap um, in, in use of social media. And as we've seen some of the crisis headlines that have, and the issues that have percolated over the last year or so, and one of the most interesting things is that we sometimes have heard the charge that those in higher education seem a little tone deaf um, to some of the conversations that are going on in the public. And I think what's interesting here is that it's my personal opinion that that 40% gap shows that it is their, their sounding tone gap perhaps potentially because they are. That where the conversations are happening is in these social media channels and they're very passionate conversations. And if one in five academics are, 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 are not there, or are only one in five are there, the majority are not there, it means that many of us are not hearing the actual conversations that are happening. Um, so I think that it is that 40% gap that in my personal opinion is that where issues kind of evolve into crises. Um, so if I were to give advice on this particular slide, I would just continue to really recommend and urge that universities start using their social media channels as listening channels with the public. Very, very important. Many of us think of it as an outbound publishing channel, but those of you that are managing social media channels know how important the dialogue is. And I think that I would urge higher education leaders to understand that and maybe empower those folks who are your social media kind of leaders and voices to be able to listen to and flag issues or concerns or questions as they arise and not just have the university expect that be an outbound channel. Um, so very quickly, last major point here, and then I think we can go into questions, is um, we took a look across um, what social channels you know folks are using. Um, Facebook is ascendant. Facebook is king right now. Um, I think that we're seeing a really quick surge in how universities and the public are engaging on Facebook, which is interesting. Uh, back to the question about peers, I think if you look at LinkedIn, you see very interestingly that many of uh, those in academia who are in, who are on online, they tend to also very much be on LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn could be potentially a very interesting channel for peer communications. Um, the right hand side you'll see that again we saw almost one in five are not using any social media network at all. 
Um, so I think, um, oh, and also, yes, I will we'll do this differently um, next year, and we will definitely take a look at Snapchat. Didn't this year. It's been astonishing how fast Snapchat has come on, um, even in the last six to eight months. So that's not on here. Right. People ask me, Instagram, what, what is with Instagram and, and universities? How, could, why is, how does that work? We see um, sites like Instagram and even, to some extent, Pinterest um, are brand validation sites for universities. Um, students... Uh, and folks are going to Instagram um, accounts of your students and of your um, faculty and, and, and staff and peers um, to see if, if what you say is really true or what it's like to be there. So, you know, I guess the takeaway here, and then I'll take a breath, um, is that, um, again, the places where the public is having conversations is very different. It's online, it's diverse, it's changing quickly. And again, communication is one of one, but again, I think it's very important for our education leaders to really see this in context, that we need to be where the public is in order to inform their opinion. We can't expect that they're necessarily always going to come to us. Um, and so with that, I think that you know, those are some of the top, top takeaways. Now, that's great. One point of clarification back on your media preferences as you were looking through that data. Yep. Separate column for online news versus newspapers. Were newspapers just the physical paper, or did that include digital versions? Um, that is, we left it open, but it is basically the physical, the physical paper. I think um, we're, we see a little bit of a crossover there in some of our other data that um, that definitely the online news um, portion of, of, of what's happening is, is really kind of much more powerful um, for the most part for the general public. Um, but those of us that have worked with boards and presidents and top university leaders know that many of them don't believe it's real until it's ink on paper in, in the New York Times. Um, but in reality, those things that drive the public's opinion had much more digital, much more shareable. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of the other strategies that we really like is taking great stories um, that, that come up that really kind of help tell the good stories about universities and, and learn how to put paid amplification behind those stories. Um, so I think that's one of the things that we're doing is understanding now media stories are pieces of content that universities and colleges have the ability to kind of share and amplify. Hashtag Higher Ed Live. If you've got a question, we've got just a couple minutes left with Julia. Yep. Uh, Julia, if you had to summarize all of this, do you have a summary slide where you've got the takeaways for us? What do, what do us as communicators need to think about with this data moving forward? Yep. So here we are. Here is, um, I think, what we can do is just walk through those takeaways again. Kind of, if if we were to suggest based on this data, what is the new roadmap? Um, I guess we'll resummarize some of this. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, or the points are, again, you know, so much of higher education's focus on reputation really is is in in those uh, in and among the academy. Um, but as we've said, kind of starting to overlook the public's point of view is is causing risk, I think, in some institutions. So keep that in mind. It is it is not an either or; it's a both and. Connect the dots with outcomes and opportunity. Somehow, again, we need to find new language. We need to respect that the public doesn't necessarily trust what, you know, isn't going to necessarily believe if we say that a well-rounded education is important until or unless we can explain what we mean by that and demonstrate why that's so. Um, the communication disconnect is going to remain. So I think you have to connect it to outcomes both. And, and number three is, you know, also remembering it's not just about you, but it's also about them. Um, very important. The public expects universities to be excellent at what you do. Um, so what they want to see is that you're going to take that academic excellence, all of that things that just always has been the contract with society that great universities and colleges have had. That that's, I think now what the society, what public is hoping and looking for are demonstrations that what you're doing is not just doing this to further personal careers, but actually continuing to do this to further the, you know, the opportunities for students that walk through the doors and, um, and also to improve society. I think, um, in a sense, it goes back to the core issues um, that we have always, those of us inside higher education that have been, you know, I've worked in it, my husband's in it, so those of us inside higher education kind of entered this field because to us it's self-evident. It's absolutely self-evident that what we're doing is important, we believe, to society. Um, and I think that, you know, remembering that going to that core concept that how and why it's important to society is a whole new opportunity for us to talk about it. 
one of the ways that you talk about that is real world impact. Um, I think both for individuals and then also just showing how what the university is doing is improving the lives of those in your community or those around you. Um, and then again remembering that where this conversation is taking place in the public tends to be very different than where it's taking place within those within the academy. And so just remember that, and again, this is as much for um, those who are communicators who already know this, but need to pass this on to higher education leaders, that you have to really manage your strategies based on where the public is and how they're consuming their media in order to have a more, um, more significant impact on your public. So for those of you that might want to find out more, um, there's a lot more data here. Um, we also have um, interestingly, I mentioned that there's um, that, that we did um, research of a hundred universities. There are some small subsets of data that we have that we might be able to make available um, if anybody's looking to see kind of what the responses were for their individual institution um, in, in kind of a larger context. It's something that we have um, the ability to do. Um, and then these links that you have here, um, our reputation study is you can find it at edelman.com backslash education um, and then that other Edelman research that has kind of to do with bigger issues of societal trust um, is at the, the, um, at the hash or at the uh, link that you see there. So, um, so with that, I mean that's really kind of the quick walkthrough. I know we're just about at the top of the hour um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you Kent and see if there are any other questions, anything else that I can do. I think, unfortunately, we are out of time, and I, I, I thank you very much, Julia, for, for presenting that to us, and I apologize to you because I made you go so fast. <laughs> no, this is all good. No, so, this, this um, great. More happy, yeah, more than happy to have conversations with anybody if they want to dive into this farther. We've been presenting this at several associations and some boards and presidents groups and things like that. So um, it, I, hopefully the goal is to help kind of pivot this conversation a little bit and provide you all the tools you know that you need to do a better job. Well, that's you know. outstanding. Good data, great insights, and I know that, like I said, you had to go through them pretty quick. Let me remind all the viewers that all the episodes of Higher Ed Live are free and accessible and available on the video archives. So as soon as we end this session, if you need to go back and check out some of the slides or what Julia said, they'll already be there. So thank you very much, Julia. Thanks always to our program sponsors, the Public Relations Society of America's Counselors of Higher Education, and to M. Stoner. For all of you viewing, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Kent Casella from Michigan State University. Till next time, see ya. <laughs>